like to read the translation for this prayer. Every class that I do, I always say that. Uh, Krishna is the lover of Radha. He displays many amorous pastimes in the groves of Vrindavan. He is the lover of the cowherd maidens of Raja and the holder of the great hill named Govardhan. He is the beloved son of Mother Yasoda, the delighter of the inhabitants of Raja, and he wanders in the forest along the banks of the river Yamuna. Nasta Paishu Bhajeshu Nicham Bhagavat Sevaya Bhagavate Tamashloke Bhakti Ravati Mashtaki. By regular attendance in classes on Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed. And loving service unto the personality of Godhead, who is praised with transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable fact. Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chayva Narottanam Devim Sarasvati Vyasam Tato Jayam Udirayat. Before reciting the Srimi Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances unto the personality of Godhead Narayan, unto Nara Narayan Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Sarasvati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Vyasadev, the author. Omadhyana Tanuran Dasya Ganangana Shavakaya Chakshua Militam Dena. Tasmay Sri Gurave Namaha Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Hare Krishna everyone, welcome to Srimad Bhagavatam class for any newcomers. Um, I almost didn't make it this morning because I couldn't find my keys. <laughs> but I found them in the end. So before we talk about um, Bhagavatam, the verse we're studying today, Today is the very auspicious day of Akshaya Tritiya. So it's a world-renowned festival. In India it's very, very um, much followed. And in all of our Iskon temples we also acknowledge this special day. So it's a very auspicious day. Auspicious day for new beginnings, for spiritual beginnings, for giving in charity, especially to the Brahmanas. 
and to um, start any kind of auspicious um, new vow that you might like to take, improving your japa, improving sadhana, etc. So, um, so the two verses we'll discuss will be text 27 and 28. So as one of the auspicious new beginnings when Krishna Kirtan Prabhu, who's in charge of our Bhagavatam Rasta, said to me, would you like to give the class? I said, oh, yeah, that's great. Gave him Rita Maharaj the day before, I mean, then Ramai Maharaj, and then Krishna Rupa. So can you put me on any other week? <laughs> he said, no, nope, you've got to do it. But then I realised it was Akshay Tritiya, so I thought, no, this is a very good, good challenge for me. So um, in Sanskrit, the word Akshay means inexhaustible. And Tritiya means the third lunar day, or the third day of the lunar um, month. Lunar fortnight, I should say. So it's celebrated um, with the aim of getting unending happiness, peace and prosperity. And when we reflect on that, we think, well, how can we get unending happiness, unending peace and prosperity? And it's by putting Krishna as the centre. Because otherwise we'll never achieve full peace, full um, prosperity, without fa uh, fixing Krishna in the centre of our activities. Because with everyone's tried. They've tried for <laughs> hundreds and thousands, eons of time to try and find that peace and prosperity that can only be found when Krishna is in the centre. So this day, Akshaya Trithiya, is linked to a number of very transcendental, special, historic events. Um, events. And one of them, of course, you are aware, is the story of Sudama Brahmana, Sudama Bhupra. And for those of you who don't know, Sadama, when Krishna was young, he, he and his eldest brother went to the Gurukul, which is the place of study for um, under the tutelage of the spiritual master. So they went to um, Sandipani Muni's Gurukul, and I had the great good fortune of actually visiting that. It's located in Ujjain, in uh, Madhya Pradesh, I think. And they have very beautiful deities there. They have one of Sandipani Muni, and then they have um, a deity of Krishna and Balarama's students. It's a very beautiful place to go. So Siddhartha Vipra was a very poor Brahmana, but very pious Brahmana. And he went to school, went to the Gurukul with Krishna. And they had lots of exciting pastimes together, as Gurukul boys do, when they're living in an ashram environment. And one day they had to go and fetch firewood for, the, for their spiritual master, for Sandipani Muni. So they started to go off into the, the jungle trying to collect the firewood and then a terrible storm came up and night was falling. So they were stuck there overnight and finally they're holding each other's hands, they were very afraid. Finally they made it back to the ashram. So Sudama had a lot of uh, close connections with Krishna. And then as they graduated, Krishna went on to do his, perform his wonderful pastimes. Sadhana Vipra retired to his village and he was very, very poor. Brahmanas generally aren't very wealthy, but he was very poor. In fact, he was so poor, his wife dressed in rags. Um, they had to rely on the kindness of the local villagers to give them some little um, dakshin. But he was very satisfied because he loved Krishna very much and he acknowledged Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So then eventually his wife was becoming very skinny and very um, unwell. And she said, please, my dear husband, please, please go to Krishna. He's the king of Dwarka. He's the supreme personality of Godhead. Please go and ask him for help. So Siddhartha Vipra was thinking, okay, um, I'm actually not going to ask Krishna for any help, but I'm going to go so I can take his darshan. So when he arrived there, and this is in chapter 80 and 81 of Krishna book, it's a beautiful pastime. And when he arrived there, uh, of course, there were three huge camps, military camps, before they reached the palaces, 16,000-odd palaces that Krishna and his wives um, occupied. And he went through all of that, and because he was a brahmana, he wasn't searched or held up, or he just went all the way through. And he came to this very gorgeous palace, and there he entered, and there he sees Krishna sitting on his bedstead with his most beautiful queen, Rukmini. 
And as soon as Krishna saw him, Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. He's the proprietor of anything, everything. As soon as he saw Siddhartha Vipra, he immediately jumped up, ran to him, and embraced him. And Siddhartha Vipra was feeling very embarrassed because he was dirty and dusty from the long journey by foot to get to see Krishna. And he was saying, Krishna, no, 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 no. But Krishna said, no, you're my dear friend Siddhartha. And then they sat down. He put Siddhartha on his own bedstead. Rukmini fanned him. The goddess of fortune fanned him. Krishna presented him with all auspicious items, the saffron, agaru, um, sandalwood paste, and worshipped him, offered him lamp, and then he bathed Siddhartha Vipra's feet. And not only did he bathe Siddhartha Vipra's feet, but then he took the water from the feet and sprinkled it on his own head. So um, Siddhartha Vipra was very, uh, feeling very awkward, and then Krishna said, but don't you have anything to give me? Didn't you bring something for me? And the only gift that Sudama Vipra could um, find was his wife went to all the neighbours and said, can you please give me some chipped rice? So all he had, chipped rice, rice is like, um, like a flat rice. And it can be made palatable, but it's quite a you know, humble thing to give somebody. So he only found four palmfuls that he could get. So he tied the four palmfuls in the corner of his chadar, put it over his shoulder. And so Krishna's going, oh, what have you given me? What's that? What's that? And he grabbed the, the chip rice and he ate one mouthful. And Rukmini is going, no, my lord, no, my lord, no more, no more. And she, you know, steadied Krishna's hand so he wouldn't take any more. And because Rukmini is the goddess of fortune, Anyone who um, serves the Lord offers him um, uh, offerings with great love and devotion, then she has to go to the house. So um, she becomes so greatly obliged to the devotee who offers in such a mood that um, that person would receive so much opulence it would be overwhelming. So anyway... Um, Sudama didn't want to ask anything more of him, of the Lord, and after some time he left. And then as he's walking back, you know, I'm not quite sure how far his village was, but it was quite a way. And as he's walking back, he's thinking, I don't recognise this place. All the roads are paved with gems and there's so much opulence and beautiful sweet fragrances. All the villages looked incredibly... Um, uh, beautifully decorated and he went to what he thought was his house and it was like a palace and his wife comes out you know, who had been looking so ill and you know, dressed very shabbily and she comes out dressed like a, a, a little goddess of fortune and then he realised, oh Krishna, Krishna has done this. So the good, the good lesson is that you know, if by the grace of the Lord we do get some opulence and we do get some, you know, wealth or fame, power, etc. It's our duty to consider that these are all gifts from God. We shouldn't be thinking, oh yes, this is all due to me and my influence or my beauty or my this or my that. It's all Krishna's gift. We're given a beautiful voice. We use that voice in praise of Krishna. And we don't think, oh yes, I'm so good, I've got a nice voice. No, it's Krishna's gift. And of course Krishna can take it away if he wants. So, um, and there are also other wonderful events that happened on this day. There was the appearance of Lord Parashuram, who, as you know, was charged with the uh, duty of annihilating the miscreant uh, warriors, the Kshatriyas. And um, Vyasadeva started composing the Mahabharata on this day very, very auspicious day. And um, Kuvera, the god, of, the god of wealth, he received his wealth and position as custodian of wealth. And then the goddess Annapurna Devi appeared on this day. They didn't really know much about Annapurna, but Anna means food and Purna means completely filled. So she's the goddess of the kitchen and food. 
and she's an avatar to the goddess of Pavati, Lord Shiva's wife. And so she, she never lets her devotees run out of food. So of course when we're, she can see, she's a great devotee of Krishna, she can see that when the devotees are offering, offering uh, wonderful goods to Krishna, wonderful food, then she's very pleased. And I've never heard of any Hare Krishna temple that's ever run out of food. <laughs> Anywhere we go, we can always know we'll get some delicious prasadam. So um, let's look at the verses today. So that's a little bit about Akshaya Kitya. And um, please think about that today. Think about what you can do for the Lord and for um, the Brahmanas. And of course, it's a, a very special day to start some you know, spiritual um, beginnings, good beginnings. So today is the day. So if you've been thinking about chanting Hare Krishna, today is a good day to get some beads from the temple shop and chant some rounds of japa. And uh, it's very wonderful to see our new guests here on this very auspicious day. So Hare Krishna. So we'll read 2.10.27. Otsishvicho datu malam. Nirabit Yatavai Gudam Tata Payus Tato Mitra Utsaraga Upayashraya Utsishriksho Tatu Malam Nirabit Yatavai Gudam Tata Payus Tato Mitra Utsarga Upayasraya Utsishriksho Desiring to evacuate Datu Malam Refuse of edibles Nirabhidyata Became open Vai Certainly Gudam The evacuating hole Tata Thereafter, Thereafter. Hayu, the evacuating sense organ. Tata, Thereafter, Hayu, the evacuating sense organ. Tata, Thereafter, Mitra, the controlling demigod. Utsarga, the substance evacuated. Ubaya, both. Asraya, Asraya. Shelter. shelter. Translation. Thereafter, when he desired to evacuate the refuse of edibles, the evacuating hole, anus, and the sensory organ thereof developed along with the, de with the controlling deity Mitra. The sensory organ and the evacuating substance are both under the shelter of the controlling deity. Please repeat after me. Thereafter, Thereafter, when he desired, when he desired to, evacuate the to evacuate the refuse of edibles, the, edibles, the evacuating hole, the anus, anus, and the sensory organ, the sensory organ thereof, developed, thereof developed, along with the controlling deity Mitra, the, deity, the, sensory, organ, the sensory organ, and the evacuating substance, the are both under the shelter of the controlling deity. Purport. Even in the matter of evacuating stool, the refuse is controlled. So how can the living entity claim to be independent? Just a one sentence purport to this. So I won't speak very long on this. Um, so we then we'll go on to text 28. So it, it's really quite amazing when, of course, some of these um, uh, questions have been asked in the eighth cant. I mean, the eighth chapter. Now we're going on to um, answer them. Some are answered in this chapter, some in third canto and so on. So here we're coming to the lower parts of the body. And when I was reading this yesterday, I was thinking, how is all of this information spiritual? We're sitting in Bhagavatam class and talking about passing stool, <laughs> which is you know, all very interesting. So the whole um, the point of all of these exclamations is to lead us, as I think Devon Maharaj mentioned in class the other day, leading us to understand when we come to the 10th canto, the glories of the Lord. 
So these are like the building blocks and we start to recognise how amazing is Krishna and his manifestation, this material world. And of course there are um, innumerable universes, ours is actually the smallest universe. How do we know that we've got the smallest universe? Because Brahma has the smallest amount of heads. Very good, exactly, yes. Our Lord Brahma here has four heads. And there's a really nice pastime where Lord Brahma wanted to go and see um, Narayan. So he went along and um, at the entry gate he said, oh, please tell the Lord that um, Lord Brahma is here. And then the, um, the gatekeeper went to the Lord and said, oh, Lord Brahma is, is here. And Vishnu said to him, well, go and ask him which Lord Brahma or which Lord Brahma. So the person went back and said, oh, um, which Brahma are you? And our four-headed Brahma was thinking, hmm, very interesting. I thought I was the only Lord Brahma. So then he called him into the assembly and to show the point, prove the point to this, our four-headed Brahma, Krishna called all of the Brahmas to come. And some of the Brahmas had 10 heads, some had 100 heads, some had a million heads. And then our Lord Brahma is, you know, getting some realisations here and bows his head to the Lord. So in this purport, um, okay, we're here, here we're talking about the lower parts of the body. So in this purport, Prabhupada's pointing out to, this, to us that even something as relatively simple, the body is extracting the nutrients out of the food that we eat, the prasadam that we eat, and then cleansing out the rest so the body doesn't become... Um, Toxic, but the soul, you know, we don't get sick. So, um, but we can't even we can't even do that when we want to. You know, how many times, especially as you're older, they have these these maps of the different toilets and all the areas. So as you get older, you might need to suddenly go to the bathroom. Oh, oh, I can go to that bathroom. So even that we can't control, and of course, in old age, it gets even worse. So. Um, the you know lack of being able to, to evacuate or pass urine when you want to that's actually not the case it's when it's out of our control and it's when it just happens as as Mitra is controlling it so Bhagavatam also describes that even the blinking of our eyelids is not controlled by us it's controlled by various demigods so we have our senses but without light for example, we can't see. So the sun god is in charge of the power of sight. And, um, and we're also controlled by the sun god in not only the fact that he's, you know, helping us grow produce as the moon does, but also with our eyesight. So similarly, all the sense we, senses we have are controlled by the superior demigods. And they're also as much living entities as we are, but they're specially empowered by the Lord. They're like his managers. We have the department heads and the demigods are the department heads. So in Sanskrit, the controlled living entity is called the Adiyatmika person and the controller is the Adidevic person. There's always those two elements that we are the controlled jiva and we are being controlled by um, the appointed Krishna's appointed demigods. So in, um, I was listening, I think it was a Bhakti Tru Maharaj class, and he was talking about um, this part of the brain, and I think it's called the humongulus. Any scientists here? Humongulus, I think that's the correct name. So that actually controls the different parts of the body. So that sends the direction to the hand to lift the hand or the blinking of the eye. So that's like the material aspect of it, that humongous is controlling the brain. So when we think we're lifting our hand, we're actually, the hand's not lifting, it's this part of the brain that's sending the directions. So the demigods are like that. So in a subtle way, they're through our subtle body and they're, and they're giving us that direction perhaps through the homongulus, that it's not that you know, you've know got a demigod that's sitting in your hand and you have to control it 
or a demigod sitting in your eyes and you know tells you what to drink. It's much more subtle than that kind of you know gross um, um, manifestation. So they're like the puppeteers, and who are we? We're the little puppets that we're being you know manipulated or controlled by others. So in any circumstance, we're not independent, but we think we are. We really think that I have the independent choice. Just like this morning, you know, I wasn't, I'm not well at the moment, don't worry, I don't have COVID. So um, I couldn't sleep very well last night, despite, you know, please Krishna, I went to sleep, but I couldn't sleep. And then everything is getting all ready and I'm rushing to the car and then no car keys, no house keys. What had I done with the house keys? And I, I'm very particular. I put them in a certain place. I knew that I'd put them in my basket and couldn't find them. So I'm dashing around and then, of course, eventually found them on the, you know, a chair in my room. So it's all of these things, these little things that teach us actually we are really not in control of anything. But we do have free will. And we have that free will that we can exercise by serving the Lord. That's where our free will comes in. But even then, in fourth canto, it describes that Krishna actually has the power because he's in the, the prana of the living entity, he's in the life areas of the living entity. He can actually induce all the living entities to perform devotional service to him. He could actually induce us to do that because he's the supreme controller. But he doesn't. Because what's the point of forcing someone to serve you or forcing someone to love you? When it's spontaneous and coming from your free desire to do so, that's the most pleasing to Krishna. And then also it explains in that same purport that if you're, any service that you do also has to be sanctioned by the Lord. And it's such a, a verse that, and a purport that requires such deep contemplation, is that inducement and the sanctioning. So we can all pray to Krishna, please Krishna, induce us to continue devotional service, induce us and sanction the service that we perform for you. So I really, one of my favourite verses is, is that one. So now we'll read verse 28. Ashishripsho parapurya nabidvaram apannata tatra panastato mrityu prikaktvam ubayasrayam. And I won't read the synonyms, synonyms. Translation. Thereafter, when he desired to move from one body to another, the navel and the air of departure and death were combinedly created. The navel is the shelter for both namely death and the separating force. So I've got a, a longer purport to, to this one. Not that long though, so I'll read that. Purport. The prana vayu continues the life and the akana vayu stops the living force. Both the vibrations are generated from the abdominal hole, the navel. This navel is the joint from one body to the other. Lord Brahma was born of the abdominal hole of Kabadaksha Vishnu as a separate body. And the same principle is followed even in the birth of any ordinary body. The body of the child develops from the body of the mother. And when the child is separated from the body of the mother, it is separated by cutting the navel joint. And that is the way the Supreme Lord manifested himself as separated many. The living entities are therefore separated parts and thus they have no independence. Uh, translation again, thereafter, when he desired to move from one body to another, the navel and the air of departure and death were combinedly created. The navel is the shelter for both, namely death and the separating force. Very, very interesting. Um, statements in this section of Bhagavatam. So we're, we're talking about the Vishnu aspects of the Lord in these verses. So as um, we learnt on um, Monday's class that there's Mahavishnu, 
or Karana Daksha Vishnu, there's Kaba Daksha Vishnu, as Prabhupada mentions here, and the Virata Rupa or Virata Purusha. So Mahavishnu, as many of you know, lies down in the causal ocean. And then from his pores of his body and from his mouth as he's breathing, all the innumerable universes are manifested. And there are so many, even in one universe, it's like, and Prabhupada gives the example, like in a bucket of mustard seeds. Has everyone seen what a mustard seed looks like? It's a very minuscule, it's a tiny, tiny little seed. And just one universe is, you could liken that to a material example, full of mustard seeds. You can't count how many planets. And our universe, as I said earlier, is small. Prabhupada says, it can actually be, um, you know, so, so much um, vaster, so many more planets and universes in, in different parts of the manifestation. So then Prabhupada points out here, Lord Brahma is manifested from the lotus, the stem coming from the, um, the Lord's navel, and a lotus manifests on top, and then he's in meditation, and it's all dark, there's no sound, and Lord Brahma is there thinking, what's going on here? It's complete blackness. And then out of the ether, what sound comes? Nandi? Tapa. Tapa means austerity. So Lord, then Brahma, Lord Brahma then goes into his deep med meditation and then slowly everything becomes manifest. So, as I referred to earlier, in Chapter 8 there were many questions that were being posited, which some of them are being answered in this one. So, in Chapter 8, um, in verse 11, we read this, this question, two questions. A learned Brahmana, it was formally explained that all the planets of the universe, with their respective governors, are situated in the different parts of the gigantic body of the Virat Purush. I have also heard that the different planetary systems are supposed to be in the gigantic body of the Virat Purusha, but what is their actual position? Will you please explain that? So the questions, these questions are being answered in these verses that we're studying now, and here are the various governors of the universe is being described. We've heard about one of them, Mitra, who's in control, who's managing the evacuating process, the sun god is in charge of the eyes, etc. Um, and the point's being made that from the Supreme Lord everything is coming. So Lord Brahma's creation is known as the secondary creation because he's taking all of the elements that Krishna has provided, that Vishnu has provided, and he's, through the grace of the Lord, he's manifesting um, all of these different elements that we're seeing, that he's only the secondary creator. It's like if a carpenter's, you know, provided with a block of wood and he makes something out of it. You can't say, oh, well, I created this, because actually the source of what he was creating is the block of wood that someone gave him. So that's a, a simple way of understanding how Krishna manifests, or Lord Brahma manifests their creation via Lord Krishna. So it's, um, it's very hard to try to be independent because we're really not in control. We may think, um, you know, just as pointed out on Monday, we can buy a ticket to the aeroplane so, okay, we have free will there. We can buy it or not buy it. But once you get there, you can't do anything except maybe choose the kind of drink that you want. Will I have a Diet Coke or will I have um, an orange juice or um, will I not just have anything? But you can't get off the plane. So our bodies are chosen for us by our desires. So in the Gita it talks about at the time of death, what you are thinking of at the time of death is the kind of body that you will take. So if a, a person is very attached to their wife, watch out, you might take birth as a woman. Uh, 
if a woman's very attached to a man, watch out, you might again have to take birth and have a man's body. Both bodies you have the equal problems. The male body, you have a certain set of problems. The female body, you have another set of problems. But you always have problems. So this whole <coughs> concept is that, you know, somehow or other we can practice throughout our whole life. And this is why Prabhupada set up his society so that as collectively and as a group, we can help each other expand in our service, expand in our, um, develop our knowledge of Krishna consciousness. And when we're having difficulty, may Krishna point out a guiding hand to us. So it's very important that each of us is really part of the Are You OK movement. So if we see devotees that, even if we don't know them very well, that if we see, not just devotees, but anybody, that we make a point of checking in how they're going. Like, I'm always bothering the young boys in the ashram a couple of times a week. How are you going? How's everything in the ashram? Everything OK? Here, take my phone number if you need to talk to a mata. He's not your, your biological mother. Call me up. Let me know how you're going. And, you know, regularly, if we can all check in with the devotees to see how they're going, it's really, really important. Because when we come to the temple, we're here for a short period of time and we may overlook certain devotees if they're quiet or, you know, shy. They're not, you know, outgoing. We may overlook them. But I think it's something that would be very pleasing to Srila Prabhupada that we also make a point of making sure that each of our community members is um, happy if they need any help. It's kind of our, our obligation, really, that we should do. And that pleases Prabhupada. And I heard a very early lecture of Prabhupada's in the late 60s. And Prabhupada was then talking about Vaishnava care. He didn't call it Vaishnava care, but he said, all of you members of ISKCON are family. So it's very important that you make sure that you look after each other. And of course, you know, in the, in the early part of ISKCON, we didn't really get that. I know I didn't get it. We were very much flying our own plane. We weren't so much concerned with how the person standing next to me was doing. We were really focused on, at least speaking for myself, focused on how am I doing. So eventually, uh, as we matured, as we got older, then we could see there was so much scope for making sure that um, our members are taken care of and that they are functioning to the best of their capability. So we have a sense of responsibility there. Um, so it's important that we're not, we understand that we're not independent, but we do have free will and we, it's our duty to ask questions also, not just to accept things blindly. And Prabhupada would often tell us that, ask questions, ask questions. He liked that healthy debate. In fact, if um, uh, Jai Bhattaka Maharaj uh, uh, gives a nice example in his own life that when he was a bhakta, he would always make a point of asking Prabhupada questions, always. And one day, Bhakta Jai, which was his name before initiation, wasn't there at the class. And at the end of the class, no one had any questions. And Prabhupada said, where is Bhakta Jai? He has so many nice questions for me. And often I think these days, I never once asked Srila Prabhupada a question. I don't know, was I so dull-headed that I just couldn't think of a question to ask? And now I have so many questions. <laughs> so then I approach my seniors um, and ask them, what, you know, what about this? Do you know about that? So when you all have your um, living gurus, Ask questions. You know, study the philosophy. Study Prabhupada's books very well. And when, when your spirit ma spiritual master comes or when you write to him, ask him a spiritual question. 
Don't ask him, should I get married or should I go here or should I go there? That's not his duty. His duty is to give you spiritual illumination. So, you know, approach Prabhupada's books with an analytical mind and write your questions. And if you can't find someone who's your senior who can answer it, then ask your spiritual master. Very, very important to have that, you know, sharp brain. And my dear God sister, Jamuna Devi, she would always take extensive notes in when she um, heard Prabhupada's lectures. And I, I often tell the ladies in the ashram, take your notebooks to class, write down points, write down things of interest because we have Kali Yuga brains and when we <laughs> finish class and two hours later we're thinking, mm, what was that in class? <laughs> so it's really, really good. And when you're studying Prabhupada's books, take notes. You know, I have an alphabetical um, index book that when I'm reading something that's really valuable, I'll go, okay, there's something about Lord Brahma. And then I, I go to my book and I open the letter B and then I write all my notes there. It's really good to have some kind of a system for study, not just to sit there and in one ear and out the other. <laughs> um, and in this report, Prabhupada's talking about death. So the navel is a source of life, the navel is a source of death. Um, and then there's a wonderful prayer, and that led me to thinking because next week I turn a venerable old age of 70. <laughs> so, you know, I've always been thinking about death, death since I was about 13 years old, so there's nothing new. But now as you're reaching those end years, you start to think, okay, you know, I'm going to get the news one day and I'm going to be in that position. When you're young, you just think it's never going to happen because it's so far away. But when you do have a number against your, your body, you know, okay, this, this is getting closer and closer, you know. And there's a beautiful prayer in the fifth, fifth canto in chapter 3, verse 12. And I'd like to repeat that to you, read it to you before I finish. The verse goes, Dear Lord, we may not be able to remember your name, form and qualities due to stumbling, hunger, falling down, yawning or being in a miserable, diseased condition at the time of death when there is a high fever. We therefore pray unto you, O Lord, for you are very affectionate to your devotees. Please help us remember you and utter your holy names, attributes and activities which can dispel all the sinful reactions, or sorry, all the reactions of our sinful lives. So that high fever is known as Pajvara, and the body reaches 107 degrees, and the soul leaves. The soul leaves the body because the body is no longer a suitable habitation, habitat for the soul. It can no longer stay there. It has to go. It has to go. So when we remember that we're part and parcel of Krishna, we're dependent on him, we're not independent, and we exercise the free will that Krishna's given us to use everything that we have in his service in that constitutional position that we have as Sanatana Dharma, that we're here for Krishna's pleasure and not our own. And Prabhupada's given us such a sublime process you know, we don't have to sit there in silent meditation all day or not being able to speak or only eating tiny, tiny little amounts of, of prasadam. Krishna, I mean, Prabhupada has given us this incredible lifestyle where we can chant, we can dance, we can eat delicious prasadam in moderation, not to excess. We associate with wonderful people who are focused on their spiritual life focused on serving Prabhupada, their spiritual master and Krishna. So, you know, despite all the horrors of Kali Yuga, Prabhupada's given us this oasis. And it's very important that we have gratitude for that oasis. And we can never repay Prabhupada, it's not possible. But we can try to do what Prabhupada wanted us to do, which is to spread the holy name of the Lord. 
and you know um, and there's also so many exciting services that we can do according to our proclivities too so of course when we first join it's like a real kind of serious boot camp surrender wash the pots cut the veggies um, you know clean the temple all wonderful services and all equal in the eyes of the Lord to even dressing the deity of the Lord. So when you clean the, the temple room, it's as good as cleaning or worshipping the body of the Lord. So that's very important to remember, not that, oh, my service is very humble, that that service looks so good, I really want to get to that point. That's not the philosophy. So um, I thank you very much for listening. It's time to end now. And if there are any um, corrections by my seniors, any comments, questions? Yes, thank you, Mani Bandha Buddha. It's just a short comment. I'm sure you're aware of this point, but I just find it very interesting with the uh, story of Sudan Brahman that um, he received such great opulence from the <coughs> Because um, when his wife went to get a gift for his husband to take, basically they had nothing, they had to beg for something mm. beyond their resources. So for Krishna, through the divine meaning of Lakshmi, um, it's not possible for Krishna to give something he doesn't have because everything belongs to him. Mm. So all he could do was just benedict him with the great opulence of the palace and etc. etc. Mm. I just find that, you know, it's like you offer something to Krishna and he reciprocates. But if you offer something that you don't have, it's impossible for him to reciprocate. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, interesting point. Another point that I didn't mention too is that even though that Brahmana, Sadama Vipra, had so much wealth given to him by the Lord, he used everything that he had by worshipping the Lord. You know, he, he engaged in the deity worship more opulently and, you know, he didn't let that wealth go to his head. He just remained that simple, pure-hearted Brahmana and de dedicated everything that Krishna had given him back to Krishna, which is really... You know, I, I, I didn't mention that. That was a nice, um, nice part. Ramai Maharaj? Where Sadama Vipra, uh, a village, it's called Kovanda, taken to very famous people. It's also a good place on Tatna Gang. Mm -hmm. And I went there to cut some of the other And uh, they say so there's a whole memorial to Tatna Gang there at this place. And it previously was called Sudama Puru. And mm -hmm. the town itself was now it's called Kovanda, that that is, before it was called Sadama Puri. And in the middle of the town, there's a temple dedicated to Sudama Brahma. And mm. we visited that temple and, there, and, there, and you go inside and the deity in there, there's a deity in an altar, and it's the deity in Sudama. <laughs> 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 so you go and you pay your obeisances to, to Sudama Brahma. <laughs> but it's a kind of a, it's not a city or anything, but it's a, a fairly good sized town. Mm. Uh, and, but formerly it was just a little village. Yes, no, thank you. So it would have taken him a day or two yeah. days to oh, walk yeah. there? Yeah, I'm okay. yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm okay. mm. The other, other thing on the chair, the which is very famous, is that the chair of Patra. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. yes. That story there of the, of the famous uh, uh, magical plate that was given by the sun god to use the end of the book in the There's a whole story of the plus and the That's another part of the on a level. Yes. Yes, that's wonderful that Akshaya Patra was a, a pot that would never be emptied. And when the Pandavas were in um, um, exile, the Draupadi had that pot. And it's quite an elaborate pastime, as Maharaj mentioned, but if she could feed 
10,000 people. And one day, you know, she'd finished cooking and, you know, this little pot fed so many people. And um, if she turned it upside down, that meant nothing more would come. And then Devasa Muni had come with his 10,000 or so followers. 60,000. 60, <laughs> <laughs> and he was, um, you know, Devasa Muni, a very interesting personality, and he could become very angry um, if he wasn't pleased and curse you. So he came with his 60,000 followers and had to be fed. And the pot was empty. But there was one little grain of rice, I think it was, one little grain left in the pot. And did he actually eat that uh, feast? Or didn't he go and bathe and then he was satisfied and went away? Yeah. Yes. He went back and he used to uh, invite me to, uh, to uh, go and take his bath and then come back for, for, for lunch. <laughs> and all the disciples went with him. And so uh, he went by the way. So then she had probably prayed for Krishna at that time while he was bathing, and then Krishna appeared, and then, uh, and then he took that morsel of flesh from the pot, and of course, yeah, as you said, that when they were all there, in the ring, when they came out, I remember doing a play of play, and we did this one, and then all of a sudden they were all very full, and they thought, well, we can't go back now, because if we can't eat anything, we're so full, that we'll, we'll be, it'll be an insult that the, the news team are going so then they always left. <laughs> and wasn't that a ploy of jury yeah, to, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, right. to get them into trouble? Yeah. So now, now it's time to engage in one of the wonderful activities through Prabhupada has provided for us, which is to take delicious prasadam. So thank you very much for, for listening. Hare Krishna, glorious through Prabhupada.